This interactive video is about philosophy in general, so that everybody can get a broad sense of what philosophy is in general. And then what is existentialism in particular? So the word philosophy comes from philia plus sophia, and those are the ancient Greek words. So etymologically, philosophy means love of wisdom. Now, the Greeks had at least seven different words to describe the different senses of love. Um, sort of, in this country, we have a tendency to use the word love in all different sort sorts of senses. We overburden that word. So what I mean is you can say, I love my boyfriend, I love my girlfriend, my wife, my mother, my father, I love snowboarding, I love burritos. But what you mean by love in each of those cases is slightly different, but we still just use the word love often, right? So the Greeks had different terms to capture these different senses of love. So there was eros for like sensual, sexual love. There's storge for like familial and family love. There's agape, which is usually considered an unconditional sort of generalized love for humankind, or sometimes it's love of God. Um, and then there's philia, which is a love for... Um, certain like subjects in particular or activities in particular or even people in particular like having an affinity for like you really dig something that is philia and the word philadelphia comes from philia city of brotherly love that's the way it's translated but it really means the city of kind of where people all have an affinity for one another and politics and such a lot in common So here's some definitions of philosophy. In a broad sense, it's an activity that people undertake when they want to understand fundamental truths about themselves or the world in which they live and their relationships to the world and to each other. And as an academic discipline, though, philosophy is much the same, except there are, you know, there's ways to go about doing philosophy. Anybody can be philosophical and think philosophically, but where the academic discipline of philosophy is concerned, there are ways of engaging philosophical concepts and materials. And that's the same for basically any academic discipline, right? So those who study philosophy are perpetually engaged in asking, answering, and arguing for answers to life's most basic, fundamental, but important questions. And to make such a pursuit more systematic, academic philosophy is usually divided into major areas of study, each of which has its own focuses. All right, but we'll look at the, the, the big ones. So first there's logic. And that's the study of the formal and informal structures of sound thinking and good argumentation. So we're talking, you know, premises, conclusions, deduction, induction, how you evaluate each sort of argument and according to what standards and the common informal fallacies. And then there's also just types of logic that have been developed over history. There's syllogistic logic, which is also known as categorical or Aristotelian logic from Aristotle. There's propositional logic. There's predicate logic, modal logic. And some of these get to where it all, language drops out entirely. You're, you're just doing um, symbolic manipulations an argument is is translated into symbols and letters and, you know, worked out like a proof, like you would do in geometry. It's very much like math. Well, math is logic. Then there's metaphysics, which is um, theories of reality and the ultimate nature of all things or things in particular. 
And the aim of metaphysics is ultimately a, a comprehensive view of the universe, an overall worldview. And these questions include, from the broadest, why is there something rather than nothing? Why does anything exist at all, and how does it exist? Is time real, or is it an illusion? Is space real or an illusion? Or causality? Um, consciousness, what's the nature of consciousness? Is it material or immaterial? Is it just a byproduct of material functioning in the brain, or is it something else entirely? Um, do humans have immaterial souls? Um, personal identity that pers persists over time, and if so, uh, what uh, what is it that persists in exactly? Uh, do we have free will, or are all of our decisions, choices, thoughts, and actions determined by antecedent events? Does does God truly exist, and if so, in what mode? So many of these questions that come down through history have been answered by physics, but a bunch of these questions are still firmly in the ph philosophical camp. We don't ha we have some um, scientific suggestions about free will and consciousness and space and time and such, but they're still wide open and still considered philosophical quote-unquote problems, problems in the sense that they have yet to be solved. And there's epistemology, which is the phys philosophical study of knowledge, including its nature, scope, and limits. And some of the questions that fall under epistemology are, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for having knowledge, what we call knowledge? And also, what is knowledge? How do you define knowledge? Um, a, a good working definition of knowledge is true justified belief. If you say that you know something, um, in order for it to qualify as knowledge, it has to be true, and you have to be able to justify it, and it has to be a belief that you have, a belief that is true and justifiable. Right? But that begs some questions. What do we mean by truth? Do we mean that whatever um, proposition or idea you have in your mind or whatever you're asserting about the world corresponds to external reality? Well, that opens up another whole host of philosophical problems. And therefore, there are multiple definitions of truth. Truth as correspondence, truth as coherence, truth as, um, as uh, pragmatism. Right. Um, also, can we truly know anything at all? And to what degree is can we be certain about anything except simple truths and arguments by definition and basically stuff that we have decided upon, like two plus two equals four? Right. Perhaps we can be certain of that. But regarding um, empirical claims about the world, can we ever enjoy any absolute certainty or just high probability? These are all epistemological questions, for instance. Then there's axiology, and that's divided into two well-known subcamps. But axiology is the study of value and the distinction between value and fact. And the two main subdivisions are ethics and aesthetics. So ethics is moral philosophy, study of good and bad, right and wrong, the search for the good life, and the defense of the principles and rules of morality. So some of those questions include, what is the greatest good? How can I know right from wrong? Does right and wrong exist objectively or only subjectively? How should I live? And aesthetics is the study of the nature of art and the experiences we have when we enjoy the arts or take pleasure in nature or have sensory, certain sensory experiences. So some of those questions include what makes something beautiful or what makes something ugly? Are these features subjective or objective? Like is beauty in the eye of the beholder 
or are there some objective features about the thing in question that render it beautiful to the majority of human beings? Another question. What's the difference between art and mere expression? Is there one? So that's axiology. Then there's um, applied ethics also. And so this is skipping back to ethics, but pretty much you can do philosophy of anything. And many people have made um, entire careers just attaching some subject um, to the word philosophy and starting a new sub-branch like philosophy of law, philosophy of religion, philosophy of mind, political philosophy, philosophy of history, science, literature, the arts, language, and, you know, basically just insert word here. And then once you've carved this little niche out for yourself, then you run it through, right? You kind of do, oh, if we're doing now philosophy of mind, we'll do metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, and it'll fall into this category. This is nothing that you need to be furious, furiously scribbling about. I'm just trying to give everybody a sense of the scope of the discipline here. Now, where does existentialism or the school of thinking known as existentialism fall into this vast project known as philosophy? Well, we're going to come back and back and back again to this subject because nobody has given a satisfactory definition of existentialism. Oftentimes, or most of the time, when you read somebody attempting to define it, you'll find the standard disclaimer. Like, look, nobody really agrees about what this is. Many of the philosophers who were categorized as existentialist were categorized that way post-mortem, after they died, so they had no say in it. And the ones who, many of the ones who were classified later as existentialists didn't want to be classified that way. So it's it's a tricky category. But that doesn't mean we can't study the classic existentialist um, thinkers and what they do have in common and try to get a little bit behind why anybody would want to slap a category on all of these thinkers. So what we're going to do is look at the what, the who, the why, the how, and the where of existentialism. So the what we got some generals here. First of all, existentialism was a term that was first coined by Gabriel Marcel in the 1940s, and soon after it was popularized by Jean-Paul Sartre. And it's a tradition of philosophical inquiry or questioning that takes the human perceiving subject as its starting point. The human existing subject as that um, person experiences the world. Right? So on the existential view, to understand what a human being is, it's not enough to know all the truths that natural science, including the science of psychology, could tell us. So we're starting to try to chip into what the heck existentialism is all about here. And just as a reminder, this is a long process and we'll be returning to these questions over and over. So as we start to lay down some claims, please keep it in mind that we're just slowly chipping away at an understanding of what existentialism is here. So here are some themes that unite the quote-unquote existentialists. First, there's absurdity. And for the existentialists, life is absurd. It makes no sense. It has no meaning or ultimate purpose. Yet human beings need it to. This is the absurdity. Um, alienation is another existentialist theme. And that's the feeling that you're kind of a stranger in your own life and in the world. You have an uncanny feeling of just not being at home. 
in your body and in the world and this is a this is a theme that the existentialists return to again and again all of them anxiety and that's the feeling you get when you start to realize that life is absurd now notice we have an everyday understanding of what anxiety is a psychological understanding of what anxiety is these themes and these quasi definitions that i'm giving you here are the existentialist analyses of these concepts and it's um they're the ways that the existentialists have sort of co-opted these concepts Right? It's what they're concerned with, and they tend to define these things in their own ways. Um, abandonment. That's the feeling of loneliness you get when you realize that no one can help you make sense of your own existence. You're on your own. Um, responsibility. If no one can give you a guidebook to your life, you have to bear responsibility for making your way through it and making some kind of meaning for it. You're in charge of your lives and any sort of meaning you can derive from your life or impute to your life. It doesn't come from outside. Um, another theme of the existentialists is authentic individuality. And that's to live in a way that's in tune with the truth of who you are as a human being and the specific world that you live in and the time that you live in and the culture that you live in. Um, reason, science, and technologies that cover up the absurdity of life, the existentialists would say, often take that away from us. So just as a brief um, comment here, by authentic individuality, this don't think like, you know, psychological platitudes here. The existentialists don't mean like I'm, I'm getting in touch with my feelings and my true self. This is a complex. They don't quite mean that. It's more complicated than that. And we'll be studying some of this as we go forward. But just keep that in mind for right now. Um, passion and engagement. Being passionate or engaged is critical to living an authentic life. And the existentialist would say it's under attack by the same forces that take away your individuality. Namely, an, over, an overly robust worship of reason, science, and technology. And then death or finitude which is, according to the existentialists, the ultimate context of all human actions and an important source not only of the absurdity of life, but the most important source for meaning. Without a true understanding of your finitude, your inevitable death, the existentialist would say, it's impossible to authentically engage the world, to authentically engage other people, to take real responsibility for your existence, and to have any sort of genuine meaning to your life if you haven't um, if you haven't recognized and disclosed to yourself, they would say, your own inevitable death. And that could sound, you know, look at this list. Absurd, alienation, anxiety, abandonment, oh, death. It can sound dreary, right? And often existentialism gets a really bad rap as being, oh, it's not, it's, it's so dreary and focused on such negative things. Um, you can decide about that yourself. I can't really argue with, with that on the surface, but there's a reason that they're engaged with topics that on the face of it sound quote unquote negative, right? But they're doing it for a reason. And hopefully as we move through the course, um, you'll start to see what that reason is. But in plainer language, 
It's about breaking through the BS to find and develop your authentic self. And existentialism incorporates philosophy, psychology, sociology, anthropology, history, economics, technology. It is interdisciplinary as well. And it's against the idea of something like this. Live like this, believe like this, and think like this because that's what good people do. So existentialism is butting heads with those sort of normative notions. And I asked the question here, like, did your mom ever say things like this to you and kind of left you wondering why? Like, why should I act like this? Why should I do that? Who says this is the right thing? Who says this is ever going to be happy? And why hasn't anybody asked me? And, you know, have you ever strayed from this sort of abstract advice to try to figure it out on your own? And if you have, guess what? You're a natural existentialist. And if you haven't, maybe this will um, help you start to do that if you want to. And even if you don't want to, some of these readings are really cool and the class ought to be fun nonetheless. So sometimes um, the best way to get at a definition is to chisel away the is to get at what something is not. Right? So this much we can say. What existentialism is not, it's not logic worshipping. It's not metaphysical system building like some of the philosophers from the Enlightenment era like to do. It's not transcendental, and what transcendental means it th is that it doesn't try to overly abstract from the concrete lives of individual human beings, from the perceiving human subjects. It doesn't try to, it doesn't aspire to this bird's eye view, this abstract analysis from outside. Existentialism's starting point is from the inside. Right? So in that sense, it could be called imminent as opposed to transcendental. It's not anti-science, although existentialism, excuse me, existentialism thinks that we, we may be allowing science to dominate aspects of our existence that um, it shouldn't, let's say that are more properly expressed in other forms than scientific forms, for instance. It's not irrational. It's not necessarily atheistic, although many of the existentialist philosophers were atheists and did not believe in God, but there were a few who were committed believers in God. Kierkegaard, for one. Now, the who, who are we talking about here? Here's just a sampling, right? Some of the figures that we'll be studying in this course. So there's uh, Dostoevsky, who's considered a proto-existentialist, Russian novelist. Let's see him. There's Kierkegaard down here. Nietzsche up here. Jaspers here. Heidegger here, Sartre, here, Camus, here, and Simone de Beauvoir, here, obviously, right? Now, the why, and we will look into this more in a future lecture, but briefly, as an orientation, why did existentialism come around? So it's generally understood that the existentialists um, came about, or this school of thinking came about as a result of a certain disorientation and confusion and general feeling of not-at-homeness, like alienation, like we talked about, that, that 
humanity, that large portions of humanity across the globe were beginning to feel in a particular historical time as a result of um, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the scientific revolution and the onset of the mastery of nature mindset, the decline of church authority, French Revolution, growth of mass militarism and technocracy, two world wars, triumph of capitalism, and the sudden onslaught of globalism and its consequences for which the world was unprepared. Now, if you look at human beings in general who are, who are coping as um, historical units with all, with all of these events, you can imagine that it, they take their toll. And our self-understanding starts to change so quickly, historically speaking, not in an individual life, but from, from the perspective of humanity. It, our historical circumstances are changing more quickly than we can analyze them and make sense of them and digest them. It's like we're eating so much that you have no opportunity to digest it, just sits there and then you just kind of feel sick, right? This is generally thought to be what, um, what instigated the perspective of the existentialists. And we will talk more in detail about this later. And the how, like through what means did the existentialists do their work? Well, it wasn't just philosophy, right? Um, even though you know, philosophy, existentialism proper is considered a philosophical endeavor, nonetheless, there are all there are artists of all sorts and writers of all sorts that are considered existentialists. Um, so existentialism is seen in literature, in music, in art, cinema, psychology, and of course, philosophy. And then the where. Well, to be sure, existentialism began as a European movement rebelling against a European tradition. But I'd like to leave you with a question here, and this isn't a test question, just something to kick around in your head, right? Since our focus is on existentialism and technology, how or why can this be considered a worldly matter, right? Why is it important? If it's the case that existentialism began as a European movement rebelling against a European tradition, why is this important for everybody, the world over? In other words, how come then this isn't simply a Eurocentric, or how can you argue that this is not simply an, a Eurocentric course of study? I'd just like you to think about that for a little bit. So what we covered was philosophy in general, existentialism in general, and before we part here, before I end this video, I wanted to show you something. Somebody put this together and it's really cool, but I won't spend long, but history of philosophy from ancient onward, right? So watch just quickly as we move through this, through ancient Greece and um, Roman philosophy during this time and early Christian thought in the Middle Ages and all of these, notice, all of these different schools of thinking, right? Uh, let's just start with Roman skepticism, eclecticism, Pythagoreanism, 
uh, Stoicism, Epicure, all of these. Look at, notice all of these different names of schools of thought as we move through history and through the Renaissance and humanism as a focus and Hellenistic philosophies and all of these different isms, right? Until we get to what's known as modern philosophy. We got rationalists, empiricists, different political philosophies, German idealism. Look where existentialism comes in, right? The, all, all of these are working off each other since the dawn of philosophy. They're all responding to each other's arguments and conclusions and insights. And this, the existentialisms are caught up here, right? It, they have it listed as 1813 to 1980. Um, but then there's these others, and then we get to contemporary philosophy, which this diagram is showing you look kind of splinters off into myriad types, like all of these philosophy of religion, but the ones that we mentioned earlier. Um, but down here, you could also add a very important one, philosophy of technology. And my point in showing this to you is that, yes, this is a course in contemporary philosophy so one of our focuses is philosophy of technology but using existentialist thought as its underpinning so hopefully that made sense it's our business to keep clearing this up if you're still left with a bunch of questions um, that is normal <laughs> and hopefully as we as we chip away with this week by week um, existentialism and the pursuits of existentialism will come into focus for all of us.